Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture we read just a moment ago in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 15, looking today again at verses 22 through 27. And of course, this is immediately following the Song of Moses, where we saw Miriam and the women uh, dancing uh, over all the floating dead bodies of the Egyptians, which were being washed up on the shore. The Song of Moses, it's called, it's referenced not only in Exodus chapter 15, but we saw it one other place. Where's the other place that we saw? It says the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. Revelation, Revelation 15, easy to remember, two 15s. Exodus 15, Revelation 15. It's going to be sung in the future also, and it will be paralleled by the Song of the Church, which is called the Song of the Lamb. The Song of Moses deals with Israel, the Song of the Lamb deals with the church, and we're studying the book of Revelation. We'll see that when we get to those chapters. Now, we were looking at the Apostle Paul's reference to this incident where God killed Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, and Paul makes 13 specific points using Pharaoh and his annihilation as an example. I'm going to run over those very quickly. We'll not talk about them today, but just to keep in mind because that's the background for what we're studying. Number one, Paul says, the mercy of God is not earned, it is sovereignly bestowed. Number two, man does not have free will. The only free will in the universe is the will of God, for only God is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, and though you need all three of those things to have a truly free will that is not hindered in some way. Number three, the purposes of God include reprobation, that is, damning someone to hell based on sovereign choice. The text specifically tells us, and Paul emphasizes that, that he raised Pharaoh up to destroy him. Number four, God destroys the rebels to terrify the rest of the earth, even though they will still refuse to obey. And we see that today, certainly uh, all over our country. God destroys, number five, God destroys rebels to glorify his own name and prove that the rebellion will never succeed. The sixth point Paul made was God not only shows mercy, but God hardens hearts to demonstrate all the aspects of his character. Number seven, Paul made the point, this is no excuse for man to use the arguments of fatalism. Number eight, that's no excuse for man to make accusations against God. That's no excuse for men to give up and refuse to turn to God. Paul has a whole section there in Romans 9 through 11 dealing with that. Number 10, we are made of dirt just like Adam, so when we die, we turn back to dust again. But God is unchanging, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Number 11, the creature has no rights to challenge the creator. And Paul makes a big point of that. Why hast thou made me thus? Number 12, the purposes of God include showing his wrath against sin and showing his grace and his mercy. And number 13, God has the right to sovereignly exercise grace to those who do not deserve it, just as much as he has the right to sovereignly exercise wrath against those who truly deserve it. We all deserve wrath. The people who say, well, that's not fair of God to choose someone to listen. We all deserved wrath. We all deserved wrath. None of us were good. The question is not, how can a loving God send people to hell? Because that assumes man deserves heaven. The question is, how can a righteous God send anybody to heaven? And that answer has come to us in the cross. That's the way a righteous God can send people to heaven. And so that brought us to what we studied last week. We saw that uh, the few loose ends that we hadn't quite covered in the Song of Moses... First, we covered the six claims that reveal Pharaoh's intent. That was in verse 9. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. I talk in the puny voice because that's Pharaoh speaking against God. Those are the six steps we saw of pagan conquest, chase, capture, divide booty, rape, prepare to execute, and murder. And those petty boasts by Pharaoh were followed by the acts of God in that song. As Miriam and the women are singing, they follow those petty boasts by listing the acts of God that completely stopped the six steps of pagan conquest. And whenever you see the acts of God in Scripture, they always declare four different things. Number one, what God did. Number two, the results accomplished. Number three, the intended 
purposes of God, and number four, praise for his acts. Verses 10 and 11, you recall, as you're looking at that passage, give a summary and a praise how God responded to Pharaoh's intent. Thou didst blow with thy wind. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? That's the summary in the praise. <laughs> after God destroys Pharaoh, after his puny boasts. That summary is followed by the two basic acts of God. Everything falls into basically one of these two categories of the acts of God, which always are revealed throughout all of human history. The first act is judgment. That's verse 2 uh, of, excuse me, verse 15 of, verse 12 of chapter 15. I'll get it right yet. Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. By the way, uh, as we pointed out last week, the contrast between sea and earth. We have the mighty waters in verse 10, which of course is quite evident as you look at the the path through the sea and then the waters crashing in on Pharaoh and his chariots. But it says here, and the earth swallowed them. The second act is mercy. God's general acts fall into two categories, judgment and mercy. Verse 13 says, thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Then we looked, and we're not going to spend time on this again, but I'm just summarizing for you. We have another twofold division, which comes after the two acts of God. We have the results and the purposes. And this is in what's called poetic parallelism, where you have AB and AB over again. You have judgment followed by mercy. You have fear followed by blessing. Mercy is followed by the intended and accomplished results of the acts of God, which is the fear of all the nations around them. That's verses 14 through 16. And then the results of the acts of God are followed by the attended and accomplished purposes. God actually accomplishes his purpose. You and I don't always accomplish our purpose, but God always accomplishes his purpose. Where God had planned to bring them into the land and plant them in the sanctuary of his inheritance. Then we saw the song had a three-part ending, just like it had a three-part beginning. There at the ending, it's a conclusion, a summary and response. The conclusion is the Lord will reign forever and ever. The summary of it is verse 19, the horse of fair with all his chariots and horsemen went into the sea. And then we find a five-fold response of God's people, which is actions, words, music, praise, and worship in verses 20 and 21. Then I jumped and took out one of the big claims of the charismatics, which is the issue of prophetess in the Bible. The Charismatics love this because it talks about Miriam the prophetess in verse 20, the sister of Aaron took a timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And they say, ah, we've got a prophetess. And you see, she's leading this group of millions of people in song and dance. And uh, so we can have our prophetesses today too. And so we looked at prophetess. We saw Deborah the prophetess in Judges 4. We saw Huldah the prophetess in 2 Kings 22. We saw her again in 2 Chronicles 34. We saw Noadiah the prophetess in Nehemiah 6, 4, 14. And then we saw Isaiah's wife is called a prophetess in Isaiah 8, 3. And I went in unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord unto me, call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaaz. In the New Testament, before the day of Pentecost, we saw one woman who was called a prophetess, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and lived with an hundred, uh, lived, uh, and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. Then we saw on the day of Pentecost, Peter quotes Joel chapter two concerning females prophesying in the last days. And it shall come to pass in the last days, as verse 17, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And we also saw that in the New Testament, I'm trying to cover all the places the charismatics jump to. In the New Testament, we're told that the daughters of Philip prophesied. And so we asked the question, did they have the gift of prophet? First, we noted that they were not called prophetesses. The noun form is not used. It says they did prophesy in Acts 21, verse 9. There's only one place the noun form of prophetess is used in the New Testament, and that is in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, and it's used of Jezebel, who is obviously a false prophetess. So then we answered the arguments that the charismatics raised, that Paul also seems to imply that women prophesied in the church in 1 Corinthians 11:5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, 
for that is even all as if she were shaven. Then we read for you the context of that passage, which is not emphasizing women prophesying, but is emphasizing women having long hair and women having their heads covered in the assembly. The charismatics like to grab verse 5 out and yell and scream that Paul taught that women should be prophesying in the church, and many female charismatic leaders uh, try to grab that verse, and they get up there in their silly lipstick and plastic hair and, you know, scream and yell and speak in tongues. The context is clear. What's the point of the passage? Not just the incidentals. The point Paul made was that whether praying or prophesying, whatever that is, and we talked about that, the woman was supposed to have two things. Number one, long hair. That's one of the main points of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 5 through 15. The woman is supposed to have long hair. The second point that he makes is the woman is supposed to have a head covering. That is, a hat or a bonnet or a scarf or a mantilla or something like that. That's followed by another twofold division here within that passage, which gives the reasons why they are to have the long hair and why they are to have a head covering. And the two reasons that are given are not cultural. It was not because the prostitutes in Corinth at that time went around with their heads uncovered. I mean, that's the kind of silly argument that's been made that's nowhere in the Bible. The two reasons that are given in the text is, number one, the order of creation, and that's not a cultural issue. And the second reason given in the text is the presence of the angels viewing the assembly in the church. That is also not cultural. There are angels here. We can't see them, but that's what Paul says. The angels, she ought to have authority on her head because of the angels. The angels are watching what you're doing, how you respond, whether you frown, whether you smile, whether you fall asleep. <laughs> oh, there it goes again. That one's going to sleep again. Yeah, I saw that last week too. We noted that we're actually teaching angels by both our doctrine and our practice. First Peter chapter 1 verse 12 says that, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Because of those two reasons that Paul gives, the physical creation and the angelic observation, that is why there are two coverings, both a natural covering, because that deals with the order of creation, the long hair, and a theological covering, that's a head covering, because of the angels seeing the submissive attitude of the women in the assembly, or not seeing it. Paul is clearly not exhorting the church to go out and get female prophetess leaders. On the contrary, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, specifically states that women may not teach men in the assembly or lead in a preaching ministry in worship, and vocal prayer even in the worship is limited to men. And we saw, therefore, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, it says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So in addition to the prayer restriction up above in verses 8 and following, there's also a teaching restriction. And the reason that is given is creation. It's not a cultural issue. Verse 13, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, so she will be saved in childbearing, if they, that is the husband and the wife, continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. By the way, that's also a very strong indication from the Apostle Paul, as Jesus also gave, where he quotes Genesis chapter 2, and he says, therefore, because of God created Adam first, and then he created Eve, he said, let a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain, not three, not four, not man and man, not Adam and Steve, not Eve and uh, Mary Alice or something, I mean, man and woman leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, singular. I mean, Jesus supported the Genesis 1 through 3 account. Paul supported the Genesis 1 through 3 account. They were literal creationists with a young earth. Anyway, off the subject. So we look at that and we find the Apostle Paul makes it very clear. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor do you usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And he uses the argument of creation to support that. Now I want to give you one more passage uh, in relation that we didn't cover last week. Uh, in case 1 Timothy is not enough to silence the women in the church. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33 through 38. Chapter 14, beginning in verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, 
as in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. By the way, that's a trans-dispensational principle. Very clearly, it was true under the law. Very clearly, it's true in the New Testament too. And if they will learn anything, that is, if the women, the wives, want to learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame. That's a very powerful word. We don't have time to go into it today. But it's a, a word that's used for very gross immorality. It's a shame for women to speak in the church. Let them ask their husbands at home. In other words, no whispering to the men about what the preacher is saying. Sometimes the wives lean over and they nudge their husbands and say, what was that that he said? Wait, wait, wait. Paul says, they didn't even ought to do that. Apparently there were a lot of women there at Corinth who were doing that kind of stuff, and their husbands weren't able to get a word uh, in edgewise, and they certainly couldn't hear what the preacher was saying. What? And then Paul says, you know, he knows people are going to argue about that. So look what he says in verse 36. What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? <laughs> Paul says, look, God gave me this word. You think that you got something in contradiction to that? It didn't come from God. Did it only come to you? What? Came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? And then he gives two very, very blunt verses. Verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet, the guy stands up and says, well, look, Paul, you may be an apostle, but I'm a prophet. Ooh, and this is what I think. Okay, Paul says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual. Another guy says, well, I'm not a prophet, but... I'm spiritual. I'm a really spiritual guy, and I don't like what you're saying. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the general take-it-or-leave-it suggestions of the Lord. But that's not what it says, is it? The things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Are you paying attention? I hope so, because this is not optional. <laughs> verse 38 is just as blunt. The guy says, well, I still don't believe it. So verse 38 says, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. In other words, you guys who think you're prophets, you guys who think you're spiritual, you don't agree with this, you know what God says? You are an ignoramus. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. So. Then we ask the question, so how do we reconcile these commands with what appears to be the activity of certain women? The first thing we noted last week was that God never gives spiritual gifts contrary to the commands of Scripture. And we saw that there is a very simple solution because there are three things a woman that can, can do that fit the illustrations that we gave out of the Old Testament. Solution number one, it appears from Isaiah 8.3 that the wife of a prophet was also called a prophetess. That would cover some of the instances. But we had some other people, they say, well, what about that Philip's daughters? Because they're clearly not wives. It says they're virgins. So how do we handle that problem? And we saw that that solution is also simple. Brings us to the second and third categories. The term prophetess and prophesy are clearly used to refer to the singing women, as in our passage in Exodus chapter 15, 1 through 21. The words are clearly called the Song of Moses, both in Exodus 15 and Revelation 15. So in other words, Miriam did not make up the words. It wasn't a woman getting new revelation and then expounding the new revelation by setting it to music. This was revelation given in musical poetic form to Moses, which Miriam and the women sang. The term to prophesy is clearly used of singing scripture set to music in poetic form. We see the entire New Testament church, including women, doing this with the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs referred to by the Apostle Paul. And we studied that in detail, as you know, for 16 weeks, where we talked about biblical music and went over all the different uh, categories of music in Scripture and went over all the different things that relate to music in Scripture. 16 weeks we spent on that. Solution number three. There's a third possibility as well. The term was apparently used for any wise woman who gave counsel based on revealed truth but not one who received new special revelation, and Deborah and Huldah fit into that category. Thus, a prophetess could either be the wife of a prophet or women singing in the congregation, or perhaps could be singing special music, which is what I think probably Philip's daughters were doing. 
They were known as the, their ladies' quartet. They sang already revealed scripture, such as the Psalms, and so that's why they got special mention. We saw a false prophet was not one who had the spiritual gift of prophecy, but one who had a counterfeit gift, a satanic infant, uh, imitation, and a manifestation of the gift of prophecy, which was false. We studied false prophecy, you know, when we studied Simon the Sorcerer in the book of Acts, and we covered many, many weeks of what the Bible has to say about witchcraft and sorcery and the occult and things like that. So, now I want to give one more thing. This is brand new, so you didn't get this last week. One final challenge that people raise to understanding the term prophetess as I have explained it with the three possible explanations. Some people reject the idea that the term prophetess can be used to refer to women singing or playing scripture set to music. These people would say to me, Heh, that's nonsense. Show me any place in the Bible where the term to prophesy or prophesied is used of men singing or playing scripture set to music. If that doesn't work for men, then it doesn't work for women. Ha ha, so there you stupid preacher, answer that. Heh. I've had people say stuff to me, almost in that same tone of voice. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever dealt with charismatics, but you know, normally very nice people, when you get off on these subjects, I mean, they, you know, they fall apart at the seams. But anyway, okay, I'm glad you asked. Now please take your Bibles and turn with me so you not think I'm making this up. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 25. Is this term used also of people not receiving new revelation, but of either playing musical instruments while somebody else sings scripture, or of singing scripture itself? Let's look at 1 Chronicles chapter 25, where we see men singing and playing musical settings of scripture. 1 Chronicles chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, David and the captains of the host separated to the service of the sons of Asaph and of Heman and of Jeduthun. Now listen to the next phrase. Who should prophesy with harps, with psalteries, and cymbals. So playing some musical instruments here. Uh, Horns are mentioned a little bit later on, that is, trumpets and things like that. So you got all the different categories of music, or of musical instruments, harps, psalteries, and cymbals, and the number of the workmen according to their service was. Verse 2, of the sons of Asaph, Zachur, and Joseph, and Nethaniah, and Asarela, the sons of Asaph, under the hand of Asaph. Now look at the next phrase. Which prophesied according to the order of the king. Now let's talk about the gift of prophecy for just a second. Do you prophesy upon the order of governmental authorities? Prophecy is not a matter of prophesying, if you're talking about forthtelling and foretelling, is not a matter of the government says, now tell me what's going to happen next. We see a few illustrations of that in scripture uh, where we have some prophets who are not very happy and do some funny things. But that's really not how prophecy came. The Spirit of God comes on the individual, on the man, and he speaks forth the Word of God. In the Old Testament, sometimes it was totally uncontrollable, like Saul going after David wanted to kill him. He came across some of the sons of the prophets prophesying. It says, Saul, this robe fell down and started prophesying too. And they said, is Saul also among the sons of the prophets? Here we find that term is being used for both instrumental and vocal performance of scripture, which prophesied according to the order of the king. Verse three of Jeduthun, the sons of Jeduthun, Gedaliah and Zeri, and Jeshiah and Hashabiah and Mattathiah, six under the hands of their father Jeduthun, now get the next phrase, who prophesied with a harp to give thanks and to praise the Lord. Clearly, this is musical presentations that are going on. Then we get to verse 4 of Heman, the sons of Heman, Bukiah, Mattaniah, Uziel, Shebuel, Jeremoth, Hananiah, Hanani, Eliathoth, Gidalti, Romam Tiezer, Josh Bekasha, getting harder and harder, Malothi, Hathir, and Mahaziot. Then verse 5, all these were the sons of Heman, the king's seer. Now listen, what were they doing? Was it just playing music? No words? In the words of God to lift up the horn, 
And God gave Heman 14 sons and three daughters. That's why he was a He-Man and I'm not. He had 14 sons. I've only got eight sons and uh, five daughters, but he was a He-Man. He had 14 sons and three daughters. Joke. Verse 6. Look at this. All these were under the hands of their father for song, S-O-N-G, in the house of the Lord with cymbals and psalteries and harps for the service of the house of God according to the king's order to Asaph, Jedithon, and Heman. So the number of them with their brethren, get the next phrase, that were instructed in the songs of the Lord, even all that were cunning was 200, fourscore, and eight. It's clearly used that way of all of the temple musicians, this word for prophesy or to prophesy or prophesied, past tense, it is used of the musical presentation of the word of God, principally, of course, in this case would have been the Psalms, because David's the one who's commanding it, and David wrote, and we just read the, the 150th of those Psalms this morning, as we have gone through in our responsive readings, the entire book of Psalms. So I hope you get the point. Since God does not disagree with himself, and he did not inspire scripture to be contradicted with other scripture, the most obvious solution is this one to the female prophetess situation in the Bible. So that brings us to a new section to our material for today, where we find Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, four different things. Those are not just a repetition. Four different things we'll see when we get to them. God said you've got to do all four of them, not three, not one, and sort of the other three, all four of them. Then God said, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee, Jehovah Rapha. And they came to Elim, where were twelve wells of water and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. So as we look at this passage today, as we really begin to dig into it, the first thing that we notice in our overview is that one of the most important principles of God in his plan for divine training and discipline of his people is set forth in this passage. You've heard the phrase, I mean, I'm sure all of you have, no pain, no gain. But you know, that's not just an athletic principle. It's a divine principle that God uses to conform his people to the image of Christ. That is foreshadowed in Abraham's furnace and lamp in Genesis 15, 17. The blazing, smoking furnace and then a lamp. When God cut his covenant with Abraham. And of course we find that restated in not just chapter 15, but chapter 17, chapter 21, chapter 22. Uh, we find that Abrahamic covenant restated. We also see that principle in pain first for focus, cleansing, and growth. You know, that's why God allows pain in your life. Did you know that? To focus you on the things that are important. To cleanse you from the things that are sinful. And to help you grow in your spiritual life. Those are the three reasons for pain in your life. Number one, focus. Quit getting your eyes on the things of earth. The things of earth do not last. You can get all this clutter and pile it into your garages and into your houses and into the driveways and into the front yard and into the backyard and stuff your car full of them and you can't take it with you. God sends you pain to help you sharpen your focus. What's important and what is not important. When you start feeling some of the pain and I'm not just talking physical pain. There's all kinds of pain, as you know, in life. But when you start feeling some of the pain, ask yourself the question. It's where you should start. Lord, where do you want me to focus? Where have I gotten my focus off of Christ? Where am I not looking the right direction? First principle of pain 
is where does God want me to focus? The second principle of pain is cleansing. Jesus talks about that over in John chapter 15, you know, chapters 14, 15, and 16, upper room discourse, where Jesus talks about in chapter 15 that he is the vine, we're the branches. And he talks about every branch that doesn't bear fruit, he purges it. That's he cuts off the branches that don't bear fruit. He trims them. That's painful. We don't like to see some of those things go, but he's busy clipping in our lives. And he talks about four levels of fruit bearing. He talks about bearing fruit, more fruit, much fruit, and abiding fruit. Four, type, four levels of fruit bearing in John chapter 15. And he wants us to have much fruit that is abiding fruit. Not that's there and sort of then disappears. Not plastic bananas hung on palm trees. Pain is for cleansing, which brings you to the last stage. Pain is for growth. Many, many, many years ago, back before the flood, you know, I came on board with Noah sort of hanging on the outside. Long time ago, I used to run. And I had a coach who made us go through pain in cross country. And we would come home literally with bleeding feet, blisters that had broken, and he wouldn't let us walk when we were supposed to be running. And we hated it. We hated it. But we also run, won all of our races. Tiny little boys school of 200 boys beating all the big, huge public schools in New York City, all the big college preparatory schools all over the Northeast, beating West Point Military Academy on their home course. He knew that pain produced growth. It produced strength. It produced endurance. It motivated us to push a little harder when the race came. And that's why God brings pain into your life. He wants you to move to that point whereby you face all of life in the strength of Christ. Spiritual growth. But you know, it's not only found here in this passage. We find it all over the Bible. Mara, of course, here, the bitter water made sweet was before Elim, which was water that was sweet from the beginning. We'll be talking about that more, the Lord willing. But you think about this, wilderness before Canaan. They wandered for 40 years before they had 40 years of conquest. They dragged through the desert and through the desert and through the desert and through the desert. And of course, this little mini-series here is Bitter Waters and Sweet Naomi in the Desert because, of course, Naomi, after she had gone through that desert experience with her husband who died and her sons died and she's coming back to the land, she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which is bitter, bitter. And then God gave her sweetness. I love the book of Ruth. There's a lot of, lot of practical principles in it. We'll get to those a little bit later on. But So we've got the wilderness before Canaan, 40 years of wandering before 40 years of conquest. Of course, the greatest example is the cross before the crown. That's clear from the example of Christ, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus is God. I hope you get that from what Paul writes. It's all over the New Testament. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, that's us, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, now listen, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Cross before crown. Humility before exaltation. Even the death of the cross. Wherefore, because he did this, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. Even the devil is going to crack the knee and fall on his face in front of Jesus. He'll hate it, but he will do it. 
because God has ordained it, he will tolerate no rebellion. The demons will hate it. The anti-generate will hate it, but they will bend the knee. For Jesus is Lord. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and at every tongue. That means the devil's tongue too, the demon's tongues too, the unregenerate pagans who use Jesus' name as a blasphemous curse word. Every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The devil is going to have to fall on his face flat and say, he'll hate to do it, but he has to do it. Jesus is Lord. The devil is not Lord. The demons are not Lord. The petty rulers of earth like Pharaoh are not Lord. Jesus is Lord. And that will give glory to God the Father. The example of Christ revealing this principle is the most beautiful example of what I have taught you repeatedly over the last nine and a half years. It's a little phrase. I think you all will remember it. The way up is down. The way up is down. You don't just climb the ladder, you go to the cellar and you start digging down if you want to go up. The way up is down. If you want to go up in your spiritual life, first you have to humble yourself and become a servant as did Jesus to others. But there are lots of other examples as well. For example, worse before better, John chapter 2 verse 10. You know, man likes to do it in reverse. My dear wife Judy used to say, worst first, that was one of her mottos, worst first. It's better to end with dessert than to start with dessert and eat your sauerkraut last. I hope you've learned that principle. Jesus showed us the principle of worst first in the miracle of Cana of Galilee. John chapter 2, verse 9. When the ruler of the face tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. People always do things in reverse from the way God runs principles. I think you probably have picked that up. Suffering before glory. Here's another illustration of the same kind of principle. Suffering before glory. There are many passages that set forth this example. Luke 24, beginning in verse 25. Then he said unto them, O oh, fools, this is the road to Emmaus, you know, and, for, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Verse 26, ought not Christ to have suffered these things? There's the humility first. There's the way down first. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? And then up. And to enter into his glory? That was the principle he was teaching. He say, and so he pulled one verse out of the Old Testament. Is that what it says? No, it says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets... He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What was he teaching them? Christ suffers first before exaltation. Humility before glory. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he showed them in all the scriptures those things concerning himself because that was the issue. They only wanted the glory part. They only wanted the Messiah to come back and beat the Romans. He showed them that's not the way you do it. Suffering first, glory last. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So let me ask you a question. Do you think that you are going through unbearable suffering right now? Some of this congregation feel that way. Do you think that you're going through unbearable suffering now? Be encouraged. God has designed it for your good and for his glory because God uses our suffering to burn the trash out of our lives and to conform us to the image of Christ. Romans chapter 8, you know the verses, verses 28 and 29. And we know that all things, 
not some things, not most things, not nice things. We know that all things work together for good to a specific category of people, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's his goal for you. And what did Jesus do? Suffering first, glory following. Suffering first, glory following. Did you get it? Suffering first, glory following. And we're to be conformed to the image of his Son, which means that God is going to do for us what? Suffering first, glory to follow. Suffering first, glory to follow. We don't like it. We'd rather do it the world's way. Avoid suffering altogether. Just sort of tromps on up to the throne and get a crown slapped on our head. That's not God's way. Because there is a problem in our life and it's called sin. It's called sin. You don't like to hear that, but it's called sin. I am a sinner. I commit sin on a daily basis. Now let me apply it. You are a sinner. You commit sin on a daily basis. Not Mickey Mouse sin. You commit sin. God says it's sin. One sin is enough to send you to hell. Jesus had to die on the cross and shed his blood for that thing that you count so lightly. Suffering first, glory to follow. Suffering first, glory to follow. Worst first. No pain, no gain. You know, that is in the same context about working all things together for our good. It's in the same context as suffering before glory. Verses 17 and 18, Romans chapter 8, still in that same chapter. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Now listen, listen carefully. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Suffering first, glory to follow. Suffering first, glory to follow. And we, identifying with Christ. If we're heirs and joint heirs with Christ, if so be. You know, you want to test it? Is this happening? If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You say, well, maybe Paul just made a slip of the... No, no, he says the same thing in verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Suffering before glory. We like to complain and bellyache when things don't quite go our way. And we pout and we fuss and we whine and we dribble around uh, drooling over all the stuff of earth and wish we could have it and we don't want to suffer that's for somebody else that's for those super saints but hey we're average Christians we're heading to heaven so we don't need to have any of that suffering stuff I mean we're just you know on the easy train uh, you know let the conductor come by and throw some popcorn at us dear people no suffering no gain The hymn writer put it, shall I be carried to the skies on flowering beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? I hope you know that suffering is coming to the church in America. There's no reason why every other country on the face of the globe, the Christians have at one time or another experienced true suffering. Why, we should not. But most of us have blinders on. We don't see the handwriting on the wall. We ignore what we see. But it is coming. But God designs it for your good and my good and for his glory. He designs it to focus us. He designs it to purge us and to cleanse us. He designs it that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge 
of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Quit complaining about how much you hurt and how much you are suffering because of your present experience and your emotions. Because, dear ones, God is using it to conform you to the image of Christ. There's more I want to say on that subject, but our time is up. It's all over Scripture. God gave these Old Testament examples. He says it to us multiple times in the New Testament. He gave us the examples of what we see so that we would not fall into the same kind of sins that Israel fell into in the Old Testament. So as we go through the book of Exodus, I'm not just going to give you the history of what happened in Exodus. I'm going to take it and to apply it. Like, for example, right after this, we find that Israel complains after three days. It's the first of ten different complaints. God is very long-suffering. Over that period of 40 years, there are ten major complaints. They are recorded for us in Scripture. And God said, when you reach complaint number ten, that's it. It's all over for you. You adults who left Egypt, everybody aged 20 and over, are going to die in the wilderness because you belly ached and murmured and groaned and griped and complained. And even when they complained against Moses, Moses said, look, you're not complaining against me. You're complaining against God because God put me here in this position. So when you complain against me, you're complaining against God and you're saying, God, you don't know what you're doing. You put Moses in charge. There's some serious issues with that. But we'll have to save that for later. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. There's so many exciting things in the word of God, but they're designed to be practical, not merely theological. Most of us want to keep everything in a theological realm where it's just all rattling around in our head, but it doesn't have any practical application to our lives so we can just sit back and, and think about those things while we go the way of the world and don't make any waves and nothing is any different and nobody could even tell we're a Christian wouldn't be enough evidence to convict us of being a Christian if we were put on trial. And yet we claim to name the name of Christ. Father, help us to understand that you bring difficult situations into our life specifically so that we will focus on what you say is important. So that we will have the wickedness and the sin and the vile filth and that's what you call it. We call it petty sins. You call it filth. Cleansed out of our lives. And then you exercise our muscles. We get pain so that we can get gain. So that we can win the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross suffering. And now he's set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Glory. Suffering before glory. Suffering before glory. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye become wearied and faint in your mind. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. We take the Christian life as a merry-go-round not as an arduous climb into enemy territory as the enemy attacks us. But we carry the banner of the cross and we are to plant it wherever we go without shame. Again, Father, we thank you for your word and its power. We pray that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.